Mr Speaker, in seeking inspiration for this inaugural address, I reflected on an evening in late 2012. While a student at Maris College Eastwood, I was a contestant in the Epping Eastwood Lions Youth of the Year contest, a contest that I'm pleased to inform the House continues to this day. The competition involved a series of interviews, a demonstration of community or sporting participation, and two public speaking addresses. One of these addresses was designed to be impromptu. So that is, a topic is given, and you get two minutes to speak without notes. My topic was, who is your hero and why? Many of you know that I'm a keen cyclist. And so without hesitation, I dove into an enthusiastic monologue, espousing the wonderful virtues of Lance Armstrong. <laughs> Someone who, just weeks later, would become infamous not for his cycling achievements or the extraordinary road to recovery, having defied death and beaten cancer, but as a drug cheat. The experience was a clear reminder of that old adage that you should never meet your heroes, for they are sure to disappoint you. Perhaps I am overly cynical, but since that day I have often struggled to draw inspiration from any one person. Rather, I have sought to draw out the best in many while remaining true to my own lodestar. So what is that lodestar? Where did it come from? And how did it develop? Well, much of it can be traced back to my family upbringing. In many ways, it was totally unremarkable. My story isn't one of triumph over tragedy. It doesn't start somewhere on the other side of the world. I can't stand here today and pretend that my journey to this place was forged from some road to Damascus experience. The simple truth is that I was extraordinarily privileged, but not by any measure of wealth. Indeed, my parents, Janelle and Richard, who are here today, and to whom I owe everything, never derived their richness from money. The privilege I speak of is the comfort, nurture, and abundance of opportunity that I was afforded growing up with my two precious and wonderful sisters, Kendall and Madison. We were told every single day that we could be whatever we wanted to be. Lane family legend has it that these daily edifications led to some grandiose delusions. <laughs> I've been told that my first five years as an only child were characterised as horrific, precocious and brattish. <laughs> it is alleged that my sister's influence on the household was instrumental in setting me straight. Now, unlike most siblings, my sisters and I very rarely fought, and today they are two of the most supportive and loyal people that I know. While I was too young to remember whether they did in fact set me straight as a child, what I know for certain now as an adult is that I wouldn't be standing where I am today were it not for their efforts. It is a shame that fewer and fewer children grow up with siblings these days, a product of our busy work schedules, the increased cost of living, and the many entrenched and often gendered inequities that permeate even the most modern of workplaces and households. The unspoken backstory of our supposedly charmed upbringing was that it was built upon the struggle, sacrifice and hardship of others. Before she met my dad, my mum nearly lost her life in a major car accident one New Year's Eve. Told she'd never walk again, there appeared little hope of a successful career. Such were the injuries sustained that night, it was conceivable that Kendall, Madison and I may never have been born. Even after relearning to walk, the prevailing view of the time was that while it was desirable for women to remain homemakers, were she to insist on working, it, would, it should only be in a clerical role in the local bank. The suggestion of a young woman starting her own business was actively discouraged. Now, those of you that know my mum will therefore be unsurprised to learn that shortly thereafter, a small home-based manufacturing business was born that would one day serve as my first ever taste of employment. My dad was similarly resilient. Despite growing up locally in Epping, he was unable to afford a home in Sydney and so relocated to the central coast to start his own plumbing business, a story that is still too common for many tradespeople and frontline workers today. Eventually, moving back to the local area, having saved enough money, he and my mum would go on to build their respective businesses almost entirely around creating availability to my sisters and I. While they could have made more money, they chose instead to never miss a school presentation. 
Although it was never their plan, their active involvement early on was likely what nudged me towards politics. Wanting to earn some extra money growing up, Dad would take me along on some of the most dreadful of plumbing jobs. One time, digging a trench through pure mud in the torrential rain. He told me years later that this was all a deliberate ploy designed to direct my path away from plumbing. <laughs> Mum and Dad wanted me to pursue further study and seize upon opportunities that were never available to them. I often wonder if they regret that intervention. A career in plumbing is arguably cleaner than a career in politics. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, I was the first in my family to graduate from university and shortly thereafter my sisters did the same. From the foresight of loving parents who knew better, one cycle ended and another started. It changed the course of our lives and put us on exponentially better paths. I am eternally cognizant of my fortune in this respect and lament that not every child will grow up in that same supportive environment. It's why a strong and modern school system is so important. My priority will always be to create the very best standard of education for future generations, so that regardless of their home life, kids enrolled in a New South Wales school are given the very best start in life. We must take advantage of the extraordinary advancements in technology and to think in new and holistic ways about how to tackle the challenges of the future. Nowadays, we have capacity to seamlessly share the very best lessons from the very best teachers anywhere in this state. We can offer a broader range of information to help every child pursue their dreams. However, our focus should also be broader on using the structures of education to influence that which is beyond the classroom. In particular, to empower parents, especially mothers, to retain their independence and, if they decide, to remain connected to the workforce, to not be forced to choose between their own career progression or raising children. No longer can we get by with a system that was structured in an era where women didn't work and households were comfortably sustained on a single income. The great travesty of public policy will be if the education system of the 2050s looks as it did when it was established in the 1950s. It is a relic of a sexist bygone era where society assumed women stayed at home and were responsible for the school pickup. We know that each additional year of educational attainment results on average in additional earning capacity. We have done a good job at encouraging students to remain enrolled in formal education for longer, be it through university, TAFE or registered training organisations. Yet it strikes me as strange that we insist on extending formal education when the student is older and least dependent on their parents. We have done the right thing in adding a year up front and should accelerate the New South Wales Government's universal pre-K program. However, we need to go further. I'm calling on this parliament to increase the duration of the school day to be more accommodating of modern employment. Local schools should become hubs for school after school activity where the government guarantees that a child can remain on school campuses until 6pm. It affords parents flexibility while at the same time making school a place for extracurricular excellence. By engaging providers and community organisations, we avoid overworking our tirelessly hardworking teachers but expose more children to rounded experiences such as coding classes, culture and language art, dance, music and sport. I care deeply about the academic results that our students are able to achieve and ensuring that they can compete on a global stage. But I care even more that our education system helps us to create a new generation of Australians with the content of character we need to be successful as a country. It's on stages and sporting fields where we build this character. Combined, the result would be an additional year of student education, greater flexibility for parents, a productivity and employment boost to the state, financial release, relief from the high cost of childcare, and an injection of hope for potential but reluctant parents who, like me, struggle to rationalise how to afford, in terms of both time and money, children, a home and equal employability between partners. Imagine what we could achieve as a society 
If at the same time we were paving the paths of our children's success, we weren't simultaneously complicating the paths of their parents. I think about this a lot in the context of my own partner, Natalie Hissey. Natalie is the most extraordinary person I know, my confidant and a talent far greater than what any of us could possibly imagine. She is smarter than me, more articulate than me, a better debater than me, and much more funny. <laughs> Nobody so selfless has ever worked so hard, and I could not have done a fraction of what I've done without her. Frankly, it should be her standing here today. In my pursuit of this parliamentary career, I asked far too much of her, and it's only right and just now that I'm here to return that same unconditional support. Thank you, and I love you. Together, Natalie and I represent one of the largest and fastest demographics, growing demographics in Ride. Today, there are more millennials than any other generation living in our community. Our cohort is generally well educated, socially conscious and economically aspirational. Increasingly, we are new or second generation migrants and overwhelmingly fall victim to the ever present housing roadblock. For some, the roadblock causes us to recalibrate our expectations of property ownership. Rather than a freehold house, perhaps we settle for a smaller or older apartment. Yet for many, even that first run on the property ladder remains out of reach. Before I was elected to the New South Wales Parliament, I was the youngest mayor in New South Wales and the youngest ever in the history of Ryde. I was drawn to local government because I was frustrated with what I observed were Ryde's broken planning laws. It was my opinion that the wrong parts of Ryde had been overdeveloped, while rational and often modest opportunities for economic development were stymied. Nothing worked and the community was losing out. As a kid, some of my friends and I had been involved in a decade-long struggle to install a skate park in Meadowbank. There was demand well before the construction boom hit, yet it wasn't until after the new development had been built and local families were at breaking point the facilities running out of space, that Ride Council finally decided to initiate the project. By this stage, I'd been elected to the council and no longer rode a skateboard. <laughs> After my election to council, I came to appreciate that the problem, though, was a lot more sinister. Council had been living off the rivers of gold that flowed from voluntary planning agreements. VPAs incentivised councils to ignore their own height, density and floor space controls in exchange for cash from developers. It is akin to legalised bribery and promotes inappropriate rather than sustainable development. It is my strong view that VPA should be legislated out of existence and replaced with more strategic precinct-based development. Councils should be incentivised to work in partnership with state government to deliver housing supply with real, tangible infrastructure benefits. Communities should be brought along on these journeys via an empowered engagement framework. That is, residents should know upfront the intensity of development required to achieve the infrastructure outcomes desired. This model is being trialled in Europe and should be similarly adopted here. However, supply isn't the only part of the housing affordability equation. We need to be more efficient in our allocation of housing. The 2021 census revealed that there are close to 300,000 vacant properties in New South Wales almost 5,000 of them in my electorate of Ride. What use is it to inject new supply if that supply remains the unutilised asset of one with much rather than a viable housing choice for one with little? It is my view that we should be judicious about this problem and create strong disincentives for ongoing vacancies in our property market. We should reduce the attractiveness of foreign investors to freely retain a vacant property while at the same time offer more generous stamp duty concessions to a broader cohort of people, including first home buyers, people looking to downsize, and those escaping family and domestic violence. We won't fix the housing affordability crisis with these measures alone, but it is a tool on the supply side of the arsenal, not subject to DA approval. This means people could benefit immediately. 
My journey on this topic was ignited by my work in the local community, alongside someone who, I must confess, it, emo it evokes mist mixed emotions to name. Not for any ominous reason, but because by virtue of their naming in my inaugural speech, it becomes very apparent that this chamber has lost one of its greatest, Victor Dominello. Yeah. A true reformer in every sense of the word, I am reminded constantly of the enormous shoes that I have been left to fill. Through your many portfolios, you succeeded, most notably in driving the digital transformation of this state and being the first minister to successfully initiate reforms to gambling that will save lives and livelihoods. Yeah. We in this chamber owe it to you to continue and build upon that legacy. Locally in Ryde, you leave behind a community that is strong, growing and poised to take advantage of an enormous investment pipeline laid during your tenure in Parliament. It was a privilege to work alongside you as a community member, as a councillor, as a mayor, and the privilege of a lifetime to pick up where you left off in this place. The first time in close to 75 years that a retiring member for Ride has been immediately succeeded by someone of their same party. My ascension to this place was built on a chance encounter with Victor. As a high school student, I was inexplicably offered a work experience opportunity. I'm forever grateful for that because he had no reason to take that chance on me. I offered nothing. No expertise, no networks. I couldn't even vote. <laughs> the rest is history and that encounter grew into a strong working partnership that crescendoed in this very moment, a product of his mentorship and support for well over a decade. For all the values he imparted of integrity, hard work and passion for community, it was his zeal for reform that inspired me most. In particular, his technology-driven solution to government support through Service New South Wales vouchers. Through it, government pioneered the rollout of targeted, compassionate, and economically sensible schemes that were instrumental in steering this state through COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Given these vouchers allowed us to quarantine, track and review outcomes according to real data and evidence, I don't know why we wouldn't more aggressively roll them out in areas of high social need. Before I was elected, I worked in the disability sector. My role was all about advocacy, working with government and stakeholders to try and achieve real and long-term outcomes. So much of what I heard was that government, when it did get involved, often got in the way with complex or inconsistent support. The policies lacked elegance, were inaccessible and often irregular. When funded properly, vouchers are none of these things. While much of the disability system is managed at a federal level, it is right within our remit to strategically support many of the preventative health and medical measures needed to uplift the wellbeing of our citizens and save our state financially in the long run. Let me give you an example. Imagine a means-tested scheme that gave New South Wales citizens a voucher towards an annual dental checkup and clean. Households, especially those with children, would save a small fortune, and more people, regardless of circumstance, would be a step closer to achieving a basic standard of dental care. Prevention is better than cure. And through such a simple initiative, we could reduce the incidence of many major and often cost prohibitive dental issues. The consequence would be profound, not only for those receiving help in the, in the present, but for those who will live healthier lives well into the future. And isn't that what government should be all about? I think this question is one of the more concerning parts of modern society. The role of government and its relevance to the lives of everyday people is often not clear. I believe we have a moral obligation in this place to restore faith where it has been lost and create faith where it has never been. We can do that by being clear and honest with our communities about what we believe. It is an erroneous criticism, but we as politicians are too often criticised for standing for nothing. So I thought I would share a bit about what I stand for to do my little bit to establish that faith. I believe in giving breaks to small and family businesses who for too long have struggled with high taxes and overregulation, in protecting gig workers as we protect our employees. I believe in taking bold steps to achieve greater reconciliation with our First Nations people, in doing more for our environment to properly invest in the rise of new clean energies. 
I believe we can't do enough for mental health and want us to go further to address the scourge of problem gambling and organised crime. All combined, I believe that we need to put people at the centre of government policy to seek to make their lives better with integrity, transparency and good governance as its foundation. That's why I'm a Liberal, because notwithstanding our imperfections, I believe Liberal values most closely align, both in practice and in theory, with these outcomes. They were the values that were first espoused to me by two of my earlier political contacts and friends, James Wallace and Michael Evangelides. They represent our party as its best. They are smart, strategic minds that lit a progressive Liberal flame in me many years ago. I thank them for being here today and acknowledge that much of my success has been a product of their advocacy. Through many milestones, they have been there to throw me off the right cliffs and occasionally pull me back. <laughs> Together, we build a local Liberal family that now espouses these values right throughout Ryde. The entire Ryde Council Liberal team is here today, led by my successor as Mayor, Sarkis Udelian, the Deputy Mayor, Shweta Deshpande, the first in Ryde's history of South Asian descent. Councillor Trenton Brown. Yeah. <laughs> Councillor Trenton Brown, someone of great courage and integrity who ran alongside me in 2017, and my close friends, Councillors Daniel Hahn, Sophie Lara Watson, elected in 2021, and Justin Lee, elected in a historic by-election in 2022. <laughs> it is the most diverse team in the history of Ride, be it in terms of age, gender, culture or profession. It stands as the benchmark to be beaten, and I hope that someday it will. These councillors are a true embodiment of the Ride community, diverse, compassionate, enterprising, yet in no way pretentious. Many members speak in this place about the natural marvels of their electorates. If I can, I would rather reflect upon the people. They are family to me, and so to represent them is deeply personal. There are a few words that can express my gratitude to the community for entrusting me to be their representative, except to say thank you and that I will not take you for granted. Families at their best are all about love, and in case you hadn't worked it out from the T-shirt and now the pin, I really do love Ride. <laughs> it gave me everything, but most importantly, it armed me with a confident optimism for the future. I will never be able to quantify its value, but know that it has shaped so much of my approach to life. When families tell us as children that we will thank them one day, I'm guessing most of us scoff dismissively, irrationally offended by the notion that our accomplishments could be anything more than a product of our own doing. In saying what I'm about to say, all these years later, from the dispatch box of Australia's oldest parliament, I suspect I've proven my family right. Thank you for everything you have done to get me to this point. While you never did it out of anything other than love, I promise that when I leave this place, more children will hopefully grow up believing as I did that they too can be whatever they want to be.